When Pope Francis appeared on his papal balcony for the first time, I was sitting in a television studio in Boston doing some commentary for a local cable news network. As an expert analyst, I'm afraid to say that I was, to quote an immortal expression from Paul Keating, a bit of a fizzer. <laughs> Not only did I have no idea who Jorge Maria Bergoglio was, I also managed to confuse Buenos Aires, where Bergoglio had been Archbishop, with Rio de Janeiro, where he had not been Archbishop, <laughs> and Argentina, Bergoglio's homeland, with Brazil, not Bergoglio's homeland. Well, I don't expect to be invited back for the next conclave. It's not my spotty performance or even the whiz-bang technology of a modern television studio that most stays with me from that afternoon in March of 2013. Rather, what is most vivid in my memory is a comment from one of the news anchors. A comment he repeated a number of times, both on the air and off camera. He's so old, he said of the new pope. Why would they choose someone so old? At 76, Bergoglio was old. Indeed, he's not significantly younger than Benedict XVI, his predecessor at Pope, who retired because he felt himself to be no longer capable of meeting the demands of the office. Although it's only a few years, or a few decades rather, since grey power was invoked, reminding us that older people still have much to offer the world, today, in the age of innovation, the prevailing orthodoxy seems to be that only those who are under 30 and dressed perpetually in hoodies are capable of leading us into the brave new world of innovation. Happily, God doesn't seem to be a subscriber to that approach. Otherwise, we wouldn't have had Abraham and Sarah, nor would the infant Jesus have been blessed by Simeon and Anna. When it comes to popes, Catholics don't expect somebody young. And given the wonderful precedent of John the 23rd about whom we heard this morning, we don't want someone young. In fact, a cross-section of Catholics would probably be anxious at the election of a pope likely to be in office for many years, especially if he were someone who didn't share their particular view of the church and the world. In Bergoglio's case, an additional argument against the too youthful Pope comes from his own witness, confirmed by the reporting of numerous biographies, that his time as an unusually young provincial of the Jesuits in Argentina was not a sterling success, largely because he lacked the wisdom and generosity that we hope our leaders in any field will display. It's likely, therefore, that Pope Francis who is who he is, not despite being old, but because he is old, or more precisely, because his long life has provided ample opportunities for the getting of wisdom and growth in faith. As Francis himself would surely phrase it, he has grown through his experience of the mercy of God, the mercy which he seeks now to nurture throughout the whole church in the hope that we as a church might reflect that same mercy in our world. I suggest that it's Pope Francis's relationship with the God of mercy, an encounter interpreted both through his personality and his Jesuit formation, that helps to account for so much of what has drawn people to him. The simplicity, freedom and joy that echo the saint whose name he has taken as a reminder of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. As we know, those qualities have given not only Catholics, but many people throughout the world a renewed sense of hope in the midst of dark experiences in the church and beyond. As welcome as all of this has been, Ours is a complex age, one in which people hunger for, for what will uplift them, 
while also being reluctant to give their heart uncritically. That reluctance is born of discouraging experiences. Integral to those experiences is that of being let down too often by leaders, especially leaders who promised much but delivered little, who failed to act when action was needed, or who seemed too good to be true and eventually proved to be too good to be true. If we live in a cynical age, that cynicism owes much, as cynicism usually does, to a history of disappointment, a history of frustrated hopes. For Catholics, that history of disappointment includes, of course, experience with the church's leaders, experiences that the failures characteristic of the sexual abuse crisis epitomise all too clearly and tragically. It's not surprising then that enthusiasm, that the enthusiasm that Pope Francis has engendered is mixed in many instances with more than a little scepticism. That scepticism takes the form of suggesting that Francis is about style more than substance. That he's a gentler, kinder face of the same intransigent institution that the Catholic Church has always been. A recent survey in England, for example, showed a decline in the Pope's standing among young people, a decline attributed to the perception that he had simply become another cog in the machine, committed to keeping the system in place. While that analysis might come as a surprise to many in the Roman Curia, it does reflect much general reporting on the Pope, reporting that is often framed around the fact that Francis hasn't yet changed any of the church's doctrine. The reference to change takes us to the heart of my primary topic for this presentation. But as a prelude to engaging that, with that topic, I want to explore two observations on the papacy at large, observations that can illuminate some of the expectations attached to Pope Francis, while also clarifying the possibilities and limits of papal action in regard to change in the church. First, there is a widespread belief that the Pope, any Pope, can change everything and anything in the church. That belief flows from seeing the Pope as akin to a plenipotentiary chief executive, the head of Catholic Inc. <coughs> Much as the President of the United States is described often as the most powerful person in the world, there is a general assumption that the Pope is fully in charge of the Catholic Church and so is able to do with it what he will. That conviction is likely to be reinforced for anyone who has ever read Canon 331 of the Church's Code of Canon Law. You can take this as, as an extended advertisement for the program in Canon Law. That canon states boldly, by virtue of his office, the Pope has full, immediate, and universal ordinary power in the church, and he can always freely exercise this power. It may seem to follow, therefore, that any failure by the Pope to change the church's doctrine, structures, and general way of proceeding is either a failure of nerve or a lack of compassion towards those who experience particular aspects of the church as oppressive, as the antithesis of God's mercy. Yet, is it all as simple as that? Just as President Obama, after six years of dealing with an obstruction as Congress, might be less than convinced that he enjoys extraordinary power, so immediate and universal ordinary power in the church is far from being as one-dimensional as it might sound at first hearing. It's not only that unredeemed human obstinacy can obstruct the Pope, although that's certainly true, but that the canon on the Pope's authority is subject to interpretation and that there's a context for interpreting it 
a context that introduces nuances not evident when the canon is read as being univocal. That context is the faith of the church. Since the church's faith is a response to God's self-communication in history, to revelation transmitted through history, no pope is free to declare that his reign will remake the church from year zero. Accordingly, were Pope Francis or any pope to take a passionate dislike to the letter to the Hebrews or even to Matthew's gospel, he's not free to excise them from the canon of scripture any more than he has the power to abolish the sacrament of baptism. Similarly, while the Pope can remove a particular bishop from office, he can't erase the episcopate from the church's constitution as much as he might wish to do on any given day. The point here, in short, is that the Pope is not God. Like all the baptized then, the Pope is bound by what the church believes to be given by God. Like all the baptized then, the Pope is bound by what the church believes to be given by God, by what the church's tradition has accepted and continues to affirm as products of God's self-revelation. There is a danger that God-given and the faith of the church, those phrases, can be treated as non-negotiables as legitimating the bumper sticker smugness evident in sentiments such as what part of no don't you understand? Such approaches, however, distort the richness and complexity of the relationship between God and humanity played out in the church's life of faith, while doing no justice to the ongoing presence of the Holy Spirit within the church. As a pilgrim community, one sustained and guided by the Spirit, the Church is a community of interpretation, seeking always to discern how the Word of God is to be received and applied in a particular place at a particular moment of history. In so doing, the Church as a whole must discern what is central to the faith of the ecclesial community and distinguish it from what can also be true, but less central. The Catholic tradition affirms unambiguously that there is a history of faith that not only precedes all of us, including the Pope, but that makes a claim on all of us, again, including the Pope. The same tradition, however, also recognizes that faith properly understood is not a zero-sum game that generates winners and losers. All of these are important points for a perspective on both papal authority in general and that same authority in relation to the church's doctrine and structures. Since they are thus relevant to the larger issue of change, they are points to which I'll return in the final section of this paper. The second and somewhat longer of my two prefatory comments has to do with the role of the Pope as a symbol of the Church, a role that is not about power in any executive sense. When Mary MacKillop travelled to Rome in 1873 to see Pope Pius IX, she was giving expression to a deep-seated Catholic conviction, namely that the Pope embodies the Church in a unique way. Accordingly, Mary viewed approval from the Pope as something to be treasured, not only for her personally, but also for her embattled congregation. She recognised that papal endorsement would be an unimpeachable affirmation of the congregation as being authentically Catholic. As courageous as was Mary MacKillop, and as inspiring as her faith remains, 1873 was a long time ago. The world has changed, and the church has changed. 